It is now time for a question period. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. To the Minister of Health. Uh, speaker, yesterday the entire Liberal caucus gave Chris Mazza a standing ovation in his response in response to the Premier's endorsement of his right to practice emergency medicine at Thunder Bay Hospital. Speaker, here's what a medical doctor practicing in Port Francis had to say in an email in response to that endorsement by the Premier yesterday. I quote, I hope he meets a patient and or a family that was harmed by the performance of Orange. He may finally get a realistic feel for how destructive and incompetent he was, end of quote. Speaker, this minister fired Chris Mazza for that incompetence. She called him a liar and is suing him to recover health care funds that he siphoned into his own pocket. But today he's back on the ministry's payroll and practicing emergency medicine. What evidence does the minister have that Chris Mazza has recovered from Question. his mental breakdown, his incompetency, and his disrespect for our health care system? Thank you. Before we continue, before we continue, when the question is being put, I would appreciate from the same side no other comments while the question is being put, and when the question is being put, I would appreciate no comments from the other side. And the same goes true with the answer. No comments on that side. No comments on that side. Let's keep it there. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Here, the member opposite has a remarkable history of twisting what actually happened, Speaker. And I would say this is just another. Um, stop the clock, please. I, uh, I will ask the Minister uh, of Rural Affairs to come to order. No, you did. And uh, I'm also going to ask the minister to be very cautious of what uh, her verbiage is. I am loath to think that she would uh, assume that any kind of language that's unparliamentary will be used. I caution. Speaker, you're making it difficult for me, but what I will say is the member opposite has a remarkable history of not getting his facts right. Okay. So, and this is just one more example, Speaker. Yesterday, he's quite right. The member of the Liberal Caucus did give the Premier a standing ovation. The members of the Liberal Caucus gave the Premier a standing ovation because she talked about the importance of due process. Exactly. Here, here. And that is exactly the principle, Speaker, that the Premier talked about that yes, we sir. endorse on this side of the House, Speaker. There is a process. We respect that process. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the principle I want to speak to is the principle of doing the right thing because yeah, it's yeah, the right yeah. thing to do. No one is asking the minister or the premier to interfere with accreditation. We are simply asking her to do the responsible thing. The minister knows that this Chris Mazza refused to appear at a parliamentary committee claiming Minister of Education, come to order. She knows that she called him a liar. She knows that she is suing him to recover precious health care dollars that he siphoned into his own pocket. Has the minister asked a, for a report from the College of Physicians and Surgeons? Has she asked the person who hired Dr. Mazza for the report on which he based his decision that he was mentally competent and that was he, he was in good health and proper health to, in fact, practice at the emergency uh, ward of the Thunder Bay Hospital. What evidence Thank does you. she have to allow this man Thank you. to Thank you. Help. Well, um, uh, Speaker, in fact, the member opposite is asking that I interfere exactly. with due process, Speaker, yeah. and I will not do that. Yeah. The College of Physicians and Surgeons is the authority, should be the authority, and I respect the authority of the College of Physicians and Surgeons to determine who is fit to practice in the province of Ontario. Exactly. I will not interfere with that, no matter how many times the member opposite asks me to. Here, here. Thank you. Final supplementary. It goes back to April uh, of uh, 2011. 
when we first raised questions about Dr. Mazza and Orange in this House. She told us at that time that she has confidence in the steady hand and the very confidence of the Board of Directors. And as the minister pleaded at that time, she has no authority to intervene. And so under her watch, multi-millions of dollars were wasted, patients and frontline staff were put at risk. Ten months later, criminal investigation. Ten months later, she fired him. Ten months later, she called him a liar. Speaker, the minister and the premier and her caucus may consider the defense of Dr. Mazza worthy of a standing ovation. We happen to feel it's a disgrace and an abdication of responsibility. Thank you. You see the points? You see the points? Thank you. The member from Stormont come to order. Minister. Uh, speaker, I've taken full responsibility for getting Orange back on track, and the member opposite knows that. Speaker, uh, Orange is now well into a new chapter. It has new leadership. Speaker, it has a new volunteer board of directors that is delivering results for the patients of this province. Speaker, uh, they they measure their uh, how well they're doing. Speaker, and I'm sure the member opposite would like to know how they're doing. Uh, uh, Ontario uh, pilots, the most recent report on uh, Orange pilots were available to respond to calls 97 per cent of the time, orange aircraft were in service 99 per cent of the time, orange paramedics were available to respond 95 per cent of the time, 96 per cent of Orange's patient transports between health facilities are confirmed within 20 minutes, 90 per cent of Orange's patient transports from emergency scenes are confirmed within 10 minutes. Speaker, Orange is back on the right track, and it's about time the member opposite recognized the tremendous progress and thank work you. of frontline staff at Orange. The question the member from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you uh, very much, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, under the McGuinty Wynn government, Ontario has lost 300,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs. That is 300,000 Ontario families who don't know where their next paycheck is going to come from, and 300,000 men and women who are looking to the province for help and assistance. Minister, under our Pass to Prosperity series of white, paper, white papers, Tim Hudak and the Ontario PCs have put forward hundreds of ideas to help create jobs and grow Ontario's economy. My question this morning, Minister, is a simple one. Where is your jobs plan for the province of Ontario? Where's the plan? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, you've got yours from uh, Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's correct some of uh, the numbers here. Since um, this party came into government, we've had over 680,000 new jobs created. Since the death of the recession, Mr. Speaker, not only have the jobs that have been lost have been recovered, 470,000 more new jobs, net new jobs, have occurred. And, Mr. Speaker, it is occurring because of investments that we're making to stimulate economic growth by investing in our people and our skills, by ensuring that we strategically invest in infrastructure and projects that that party neglected all the while they were there, and ensuring that we made a dynamic business climate by maintaining our tax low. We are doing everything possible, and every decision we make is about creating those jobs, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Finance. Minister, you need to get out of Queen's Park and back to reality. The Heinz plan in Leamington is just another example of your careless approach to Ontario's manufacturing sector. But sadly, Minister, it will not be the last. In fact, as Ontario has been losing out, we have seen U.S. states like Michigan, Texas and Indiana creating thousands of new manufacturing jobs with cheaper energy, less red tape and, importantly, Minister, modernized labour laws. Minister, it is clear that your government does not have a jobs plan, and because of that, Ontario's middle class is being completely gutted under your watch. Minister, when will Ontario move forward, remove unnecessary barriers to job creation, and modernize our labour laws like Europe, Australia, Australia, the UK, and most of the United States Question. have already done? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite just, just compared us to other jurisdictions around the world that are falling behind Ontario in job creation. We have over 173 per cent of jobs returned to this province compared to only 80 per cent in the United States and well above OECD countries. 
In fact, in Ontario, because of our direction into new manufacturing and advanced manufacturing and new sectors of the economy that are going to be necessary for us to be competitive in the future, they want to take us back to areas that we can't compete. And yet, Ericsson Canada has invested in more jobs in this province. Toyota and Cambridge have invested up to 400 jobs. Ford has invested 2,800 2, more jobs. GM has invested and secured 2,500 jobs for Cami. We have Green Art Tire Manufacturing yes, in St. Sir? Mary's. More jobs. We have more jobs in Brantford, in Brockville, in Ampere, and in Walsburg, Ontario. Because of these investments, because of those incentives, companies are seeking Thank to you. move more in Ontario. Well, Speaker, uh, back to the Minister of Finance. Minister, here are the facts. One million people are out of work in Ontario today. 300,000 net manufacturing jobs have been lost, nearly 40,000 of those since the Premier was coronated last spring. Our middle class has been gutted, and we are seeing plants closing and major layoffs on a daily basis. 1,000 people at Heinz, another 800 at Sears, while the United States, like uh, U.S. states like Michigan and Indiana, are growing and creating new manufacturing jobs at record numbers. While you have blown off this, uh, as you have blown this off as a mere transition minister, in fact, only Tim Hudak and the PCs have put forward a plan to create jobs, grow our economy, and modernize Ontario's labour laws. Finance Minister, will you finally admit that Ontario is in an economic free fall and that your government doesn't have, a, doesn't have a single plan to create jobs or grow Ontario's economy? Mr. Speaker, again, he's referencing other parts of the world and the United States that are lagging behind Ontario. We have exceeded our targets. We are not satisfied. We want to do more. That is why we introduced Supporting Small Business Act, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that 90 percent of companies in Ontario will be more competitive and exempt from paying employer health tax. Mr. Speaker, the opposition are stalling that very initiative to support small business and create jobs in Ontario. That party is looking at cutting those investments that we're trying to make to protect our future competitiveness. They want to slash and burn and hurt our economic recovery. We reject that option. We will continue to do what's necessary to create jobs, promote growth, and ensure that we continue to stay ahead of the curve. We and need sir, to do more. We need everybody at their best. They want to divide Ontario. We won't stand for that, Mr. You. Speaker. Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the Energy Minister said that hydro price hikes were, quote, a fact of life. Ontario families are paying the highest electricity bills in the country, and they've seen those bills double over the last decade, Speaker. They have one question. Are high, high, higher hydro bills a fact of life, or are they a fact of life under the Liberal government, Speaker? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think we should review some facts. Uh, the previous government, over a period, governments, Liberal, Progressive, Conservative, NDP, had for 20 years an average increase of 3.5 percent in the rates. The current government, over a period of 10 years uh, and through our 2010 long-term energy plan, see rate increases averaging 3.4 percent uh, over a 20-year period, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what we can do, Mr. Speaker, is mitigate the rate increases. And we've already taken significant steps, Mr. Speaker. We'll mitigate rate increases by deferring new nuclear. We'll take $15 billion out of the rate base. The Samsung transaction, Mr. Speaker, taking $3.7 billion out of the rate base, Mr. Speaker. Dispatching wind, Mr. Speaker, taking $200 million a year out of the rate base. So we've already taken significant steps, Mr. Speaker. The reality is we are going to mitigate rate increases and we're going to keep them Thank lower you. than they have been in the past. But no Thank party you. over there can guarantee. See you, please. Supplementary. Well, for families and businesses struggling to make ends meet, Speaker, this is just the latest evidence of how arrogant and out of touch the Liberals have grown. 
That's right. The minister claims that these sky-high bills are just a fact of life. Well, let me ask this speaker. The $1 billion added to bills when Liberals cancelled gas plants. The $180 million blown when Liberals committed to a nuclear expansion plan that never went ahead. The millions and millions and millions spent daily on private power deals and lavish compensation, all of the government's desperate wheeling and dealing. Are these things all a fact of life, Speaker? Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are a couple of facts of life, Mr. Speaker. We've moved the energy sector from an energy deficit to an energy surplus. We've moved it from dirty, cheap coal, Mr. Speaker, to a clean system. And, Mr. Speaker, yes, rates have gone up because of significant investments that we have made in the sector to get it up to speed. That includes $31 billion over the last 10 years invested in generation and transmission. Mr. Speaker, I've just listed $20 billion in rate mitigation measures that we have already taken in the last nine months. We're going to continue to do that. That's the policy under the new long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, and we will be extremely successful in mitigating rate increases in the future. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, 10 years ago, Liberals were elected with the following promise to Ontarians, and I quote, the government's bungling of the hydro file will cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars and leave businesses coping with impossibly high hydro bills. We will ensure Ontario has a steady supply of affordable electricity. Well, Speaker, 10 long years later, the cost of hydro bills has doubled. Ontario households have some of the highest cost hydro in the entire country, and the government has added billions and billions to those bills by signing and cancelling contracts whenever it suited the political needs of their party. Is this minister really so out of touch that he's really just telling people to suck it up and pay the bill? Mr. Speaker, we have reduced the investment in health care by $4 billion by moving to a clean energy system. We've taken $4 billion out of the health care system. But, Mr. Speaker, let's look at some of the other experiences. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the Conservatives issued their white paper to privatize Ontario power generation. And I want to read from the Alex. Toronto Sun, not the Toronto Star, the Toronto Sun, Mr. What'd Speaker. They say? Who to actually keep in mind? The Tory government in Ontario that tried to do that with electricity generation promised it would lead to lower hydro rates. Instead, it led to exactly the opposite. Rates skyrocketed among rampant Tory patronage, James and the Conservatives faced with rising public fury abandoned James the scheme. Mr. Speaker, we have rectified the system. We have improved the system. Our decisions have been strategic. Moving forward, we have $20 billion out of the rate base, Mr. Speaker, and our rates will be mitigated. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Speaker, the Liberals have done nothing but follow the folly of the Conservatives on the hydro. Oh, oh, oh. My, next speaker, my next question, Speaker, is actually to the acting Premier. Over a year ago, the Liberals promised to bring in a hard cap on executive compensation in the public sector. Can the acting Premier tell us whether the plan has changed? Deputy Premier. Uh, to uh, uh, the uh, speaker, I'll take the first question. I'll pass the uh, the supplementary. I can tell you that managing public sector compensation is a very important part of our plan to control costs and to protect frontline uh, government services that Ontario families rely on. So we froze salaries for executives at hospitals, universities, colleges, school boards, and provincially owned electricity company companies. All aspects of compensation plans are frozen, Speaker. Base salaries cannot be increased. In addition, the overall performance pay envelopes at designated employers are frozen. MPPs, uh, I think it's important to note, Speaker, that, that uh, we will also continue to see our wages fro frozen five years in a row. Speaker, is there more to do? Yes, there is, and I look forward to the supplementary. Answer. Whether, uh, the, um, the minister can reply. 
Thank you. Supplementary. G, G Speaker, I'm surprised the Minister of Health could deliver that response with a straight face. Uh, look, uh, today the House will vote on a bill to cap public sector CEO salaries at twice uh, the level of the Premier's. We've seen the government offering vague promises about taking some action on this file, Speaker, but as usual, we haven't seen any action. Will the Liberals actually take action today and vote to cap public sector CEO salaries? Deputy Premier. Minister of Services. Minister of Government Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is not about vague promises. This is about a commitment in the 2013 budget, which that member and her party supported. Mr. Speaker, the 2013 budget was clear that we are committed as a government to examining additional measures to manage compensation costs, including considering hard caps. That examination is underway, and the results will be announced forthwith. But you know, Mr. Speaker, the member represents her bill, and it was very interesting when you reviewed her press conference yesterday. She referenced a particularly high salary, and when the press, when the members of the press pressed her on it, she said, "Oh, well, we'd have an exemption for it." So, Mr. Speaker, you. Can't can't have it both ways here, Mr. Speaker. This is a complex matter, Mr. Speaker, and the bill that she has put forward does not take into account the many, many nuances Answer. that need to be dealt with in a policy that comes forward. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the average household income in Ontario is a little over $70,000. They're paying the highest electricity bills in the country, the highest auto insurance premiums in the country, and they're scrambling to pay for, for caring for their aging loved ones. They're the ones who pay the bills to make Ontario work. And when they see public sector executives like the CEO of Hydro One get a raise of $70,000 a year, more than their entire household will earn in that year, they feel like their government just isn't getting it. Does the acting premier think that the CEO pay hikes are the best investment of public dollars? And if not, why the heck are they not doing anything about it? Mr. The, the, the honourable member cannot take yes for an answer. The simple fact is, in the 2013 budget, which her party allowed to pass, we made a commitment to examine it. But, Mr. Speaker, this is a complex issue. Again, I remind her of her press conference yesterday. She mentioned a, uh, a, 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 I believe it was an Ontario, an OPG official who was paid an exorbitant amount, and someone pointed out that that person had special technical skills. So, you know what the leader of the third party said? Oh, we'll have an exemption for him. I mean, come on, Mr. Speaker. You come forward with what with a simple solution to a very complex problem, which does not work, Mr. Speaker, and you have to swallow yourself whole in front of a press conference. Mr. Speaker, we need a considered response. That is the work that we're doing, and we will follow up on our commitment made in the 2013 budget Answer. that her party allowed to pass. New, new question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, in May 2012, you announced that you had ordered your ministry to review how police officers across the province respond to calls involving those with suspected mental illness. This was following a, a three fatal shootings in the province of Ontario. In an interview, you stated that we need to take a step back and see what we were doing and what is done elsewhere and to come out with recommendations. Well, Minister, members on this side of the House haven't seen any indication of any investigation. Could you please give us a report on the status of this investigation today? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I'm uh, pleased to, uh, to answer this question. Uh, you know, uh, to uh, deal with uh, individuals who are suffering from mental illness from the uh, side of the police, it's not an easy matter. And, uh, most of the time, they don't know when they have a call, uh, who is, uh, who is uh, in front of them. So that's why I have asked uh, my ministry uh, to uh, work uh, with uh, the, uh, the uh, police force in Ontario and uh, see uh, you know, what is the best practice that we have in Ontario to deal with uh, people with uh, mental illness and to look what is being done also elsewhere in Canada and in the world. Yeah. Each uh, police force yeah. Yeah. across Answer. the world are dealing with such a, a very important issue, and yeah. we are all sharing our experience to put forward the best approach. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's pretty clear from that answer that pretty much nothing has happened since May 2012, and it, the need is becoming even more and more urgent. You announced the need for the review following the deaths of Rael Jardine Douglas, Sylvia Klibengatis, and Michael Elegon. These individuals all suffered from a mental illness and were killed in a police standoff. Since then, there has been another death with the shooting of Sami Yatim in July of this year. Minister, we need to prevent further deaths like this from happening again. Will you stand in your place now and tell us exactly what you're prepared to do to make sure that deaths like this don't ever happen again? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, uh, yes. Uh, you know, according to, to the member who asked the question, there's nothing that has been done. I'll say that there's a lot more that has been done than when our party was in power because there was nothing that was done. You know, I take uh, mental illness and addiction very seriously. And again, that's why, you know, I have asked my uh, ministry to launch a review of how police interact with mentally ill last year. And we have completed the first stage of the uh, a large step of the review. And uh, we have analyzed uh, what, what was done in the past uh, 25 years and the report from the coroner. Fantastic. We have identified, like I said, best practice across the, the country, uh, US, uh, USA and uh, UK and Australia. And we have uh, reviewed existing guidelines uh, and model adopted Answer. by police uh, service in Ontario. And we have reviewed leading academic research. And we are currently working on the next step and we will continue Thank until you. we have the right solution. Thank you, Thank you very much. New Mr. question. The, the member from Timiskaming Copper. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. Yesterday, I had the, the opportunity to meet Walter Pilachuk, a Heinz grower in Leamington. Some of the members on the other side of the house might remember Walter. He's the head of Drip Irrigation Incorporated, and they were awarded a Premier's Award of Excellence Whoa, for wow. their work on irrigating tomatoes. Wow. But as of November 14th, Walter can no longer grow tomatoes, and the current business risk management programs do not cover disappearance of a market like what's happened with the Heinz closure. So not only were the 740 people at the Heinz plant losing their jobs, but farmers have lost their markets for tomatoes, and they don't know where to turn next. Will you work with the growers to create an emergency transition program and a long-term plan for the Question. industry in Leamington. Thank you, Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. As you well know, and the member knows, uh, the Premier, uh, in a role as Minister of Agriculture and Food and the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, were in uh, Leamington last Friday. They had extensive consultations uh, with all the players involved in that. And every one of uh, in this House, uh, Mr. Speaker, is disappointed with the Heinz decision. But you know, Mr. Speaker, there was an interesting program on the agenda last Monday evening with a professor from the University of Guelph. He went through the whole Heinz decision from A to Z. I recommend all members of the House take the opportunity uh, to look at that uh, program. And we know today from media reports, Mr. Speaker, uh, from Leamington, Ontario, there's a number of entities, there's a number of entities, Mr. Speaker, that are looking Order. at opportunities in Leamington to work with the Answer. tomato growers to make sure that they have a future in that fine community of Leamington. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, back to the Minister of Rural Affairs. The Heinz growers had a three-year commitment from the company to buy their tomatoes, and they invested in their crop this fall based on that commitment. Their markets disappeared, the risk management program doesn't work, and even if another entity steps up, it doesn't help them for this year's crop because it's unlikely that that'll get all put together in time for this. So will you, Minister, step up to the plate and stand up for the producers with those contracts who has disappeared and work with them to actually make sure that they can go to their bank and go to FCC and say, yes, we are solvent and we are still in place. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate that the Premier, in her role as Minister of Agriculture and Food, the Minister of Economic Development and Trade were in Leamington last Friday. They had an extensive and comprehensive roundtable with all the, uh, all the producers and the people and the economic development officers in that area. We have staff from the Ontario Minister of Agriculture and Food on the ground right now looking for, looking for perspective from opportunities Renfrew, we'll come to order. Uh, for a new entity to continue manufacturing of 
tomato and based Attorney products General. in that community. We're looking forward for our continuing cooperation and work with all the players in that community. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, I met with a number of agriculture and commodity groups this, this morning. They say the risk management program is one of the most successful programs for Thank agriculture you, in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker. This question is to the uh, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Ontario supports sport and recreation in our province, providing assistance to amateur and high-performance athletes alike. And that's what it's always taken if a community, a province and a country seeks to develop Olympians, professionals and international stars in sports. Ontario needs to continue as a leader supporting athletes at the grassroots level. We need to start early, getting children interested in sports to develop as individuals and to stay physically and mentally fit. Community centres, sports associations and other programs help shape future Ontario sports role models. Minister, how does Ontario promote and support youth to become involved in sport, fitness and recreation? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Mississauga Streetsville. Speaker. This Saturday, November the 30th, is National Sports Day. It is our country's celebration of sport, from grassroots to high performance. It is an opportunity for all Canadians to celebrate the power of sport, to build community, national morale, and facilitate healthy, active living. Local organizations, communities, and schools from coast to coast will open their doors to celebrate sport at the local level with events. Speaker, that include festivals, try-it days, open houses, and pet rallies that celebrate sport at all levels. Speaker, since 2003, our government has invested over $752 million to support sport Answer. and recreation programs. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, support for fitness and recreation means everyone has to pitch in. Municipalities can't do it all alone, operating on just the property tax base and through program fees. Community sponsors also need to know they're part of a team. In my youth, I was a hockey player and a swimmer, and governments then invested the funds to build indoor arenas and pools. We developed our best swimmers, divers, water polo players and synchronized swimmers because our elected leaders had the foresight to build facilities athletes needed to develop and compete. Award winners or not, kids developed a strong body and a solid work ethic. Being able to compete as young athletes made us better people as adults later in life. Minister, what is Ontario doing to give today's kids the same chance to develop and compete as past generations of kids had? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again for the question, Speaker. Partic truth, yeah. Participating in sport and recreation is vital to the health and well-being of all Ontarians. Our government recognizes the importance of Ontarians being active in sport and recreation. We want our province to be a healthy, prosperous place to live, to work, and to play. Speaker, in 2012 to 13, we provided over 23 million to our sport partners to promote participation and excellence in sport across Ontario, including almost 10 million for the Quest for Gold program, over 7.5 million to support provincial sport and multi-sport organizations, and almost 4 million for our key service delivery partners. Speaker, through our answer, we are helping our athletes reach the highest level of competition and promoting vibrant and healthy communities across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oshawa. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, Thursday last, I informed the House of a controversial four-day deer call in the Short Hills Provincial Park, which took place from November the first, uh, 21st to the 24th, and which will occur again from today until December the 1st. Hunters are allowed into this very small 6.6 square kilometre provincial park. As I stated, there has been a serious safety questions arise because of the small nature of the park and the fact that there are nearly 100 homes are located in close proximity. As you know, many residents of the area have serious concerns over public safety. And Minister, as reported, this year's hunt was no different. 
There were, again, incidents of public safety. In fact, your own ministry is investigating them at this time. Minister, how is the MNR ensuring public safety during the deer call in the Short Hills Provincial Park? Excellent. Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, please respond to the question. Uh, as the member uh, knows full well, uh, the uh, result of the hunt is, is part of uh, the Haudenosaunee First Nations exercising what are their traditional treaty rights uh, from the Nanfan Treaty, which was signed in 1701. So Ontario has an obligation to uphold their treaty rights in allowing the, uh, in the hunt to proceed. Uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources does have staff on site. They are patrolling the site. It's a 660-hectare park, Speaker. The Niagara Regional Police are there as well. Uh, and the OPP to ensure safety. The uh, days that have been specified, the six days, are days in which there is very low visitation to the park. So we are uh, obviously ensuring safety. It would be irresponsible of the provincial government to not participate Answer. in helping to ensure safety uh, of these activities, given that uh, we are obligated to uphold uh, federal treaty rights. So, uh, Minister, your staff say that the basis of the cull is an attempt to manage the control of the overpopulation of deer in the park. Last year, there were only seven deer harvested during the cull, and it was reported again that last Saturday, again, only seven deer were taken. Minister, not only did the Sh uh, Short Hills hunt fail to meet your objective, but in not allowing a managed open hunt to a all through the lottery or draw, the MNR is missing an opportunity to increase revenues to the SPCA. Minister, if you're going to continue to control the short deer's deer population, are you considering allowing a managed hunt consistent with your deer management strategy in the rest of the province, where it is necessary to bring populations into balance and protect habitat? Excellent question. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I'm uh, somewhat confused by the member's question with respect to safety. First, the member is talking about ensuring safety and the cost of safety and who's there to help ensure this is safe. And in the same uh, question in the supplementary, the member is saying, we should broaden the hunt, perhaps, and have more hunters in there uh, shooting deer. So I'm, I'm a bit concerned about that. This is about uh, treaty rights for the Haudenosaunee First Nations, and we are being responsible in providing appropriate safety. 21 deer have been harvested to date, and we obviously expect that more will take place uh, in the coming uh, three days of the remainder of the hunt. But I have to assure the member that safety is uh, the top priority, and I would also uh, indicate that I have responded to folks publicly through an open letter, and they should also be expressing concerns in the area to their federal members, Malcolm Allen, Dean Allison, and Rick Dyke who are responsible for overseeing uh, the federal yes, treaties sir. that are reached with the uh, First Nations in the province of Ontario. The province is doing everything it can to ensure that uh, safety is first and foremost. And I also you. want to say that the Minister of Environment, Thank Jim Bradley. Thank you. New question. The member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Under this government's watch, electricity prices have doubled in this province. One of the casualties of the doubling of these prices is the curling club in my hometown of Welland. Now, the government said this morning that participating in sports and recreation is vital, but Frank Belcher from the Welland Curling Club, the president, says because of high electricity prices, his club is in danger of closing. They are now paying close to $7,000 a month during the season on hydro alone. How does this government justify doubling the hydro prices and the pain it's causing for the residents in my hometown of Welland and across this province? Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have rebuilt the system. We've invested $31 billion. Mr. Speaker, that puts pressure on prices, pushing them up. We are now in a surplus situation, and we're now reducing the amount of investments that are going into the rate base, which will mitigate them in the future. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we've created a number of programs to be of assistance to people in the interim period, and that includes, Mr. Speaker, an industrial conservation initiative, industrial electricity incentive program, northern industrial electricity rate program, Order. and Ontario Clean Order. Energy Benefit, which also assists farmers and small business Order. people. Order. I would be happy to sit down with the member and review the bill she's referring to to see whether or not there are price mitigations in any of these programs that could be of assistance to her constituents. Thank you. Supplementary. 
While minister recreational facilities such as Llewellyn Curling Club are at the heart of the social activity in small town Ontario, if clubs like this one are being hurt because of skyrocketing electricity prices, it means that other community centres like arenas and other sports complexes across the province are also being slammed. So how does this government justify the doubling of electricity prices under its watch, the harm it's doing to communities, and what is it going to do to actually help these entities in our uh, communities across this province? Thank you, Minister. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have a long-term energy plan which was initiated in 2010, which projected average increases over a 20-year period of 3.4 per cent. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, because of the investments that were necessary in the system to get a clean system, eliminate dirty coal, it put pressures on the system. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we've created a number of price mitigation programs to help the people across Ontario, including a 10 percent discount, which is a clean energy uh, benefit. benefit, Mr. Speaker. Uh, benefit. We have also taken strong steps in the, last nine, in the last nine months to reduce price increases in the future, Mr. Speaker, and that includes $20 billion taken out of the rate base, which will mitigate prices in the future, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the Minister announced that the Ministry of Energy will be releasing the 2013 Long-Term Energy Plan this coming Monday. When it comes to the electricity system in Ontario, one of the things I hear most often about from my constituents of Ajax and Pickering and Durham is that they want to know more about their energy bills, the environment, and the overall energy system. As our electricity system has been modernized with the advent of smart meters and smart grids, energy apps and the time of use pricing, it is important for Ontarians to know why and how they use these tools. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what the steps the government are taking to increase energy literacy? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Sure, I want to thank the member for his question. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday in the House, uh, Speaker, promoting energy literacy among Ontarians is a top priority for the Ministry of Energy. In keeping with this theme, yesterday we launched a new web portal dedicated to educating Ontarians about their electricity system. The website, called Empower Me, provides an excellent overview of Ontario's energy sector and explains how generation, transmission and distribution networks function together to ensure everybody has access to the clean and reliable electricity they need. The Empower Me website is accessible to Ontarians of all ages, and I would highly recommend that members encourage their constituents to take advantage of this resource. Thank you, Speaker. The Empower Me website sounds like something that would definitely many of my constituents would find very, very useful. All of this in the House today should agree that we need to continue to do more to promote energy literacy in right. Ontario. In fact, the need to do so was identified by consumers directly and through a number of recent reports, including the Drummond Report, the Auditor General's 2011 report, and the Environmental Commissioner 2011 and 2012 annual reports. Constituents in Ajax and Pickering and Durham would like to understand how the system works and knows the ways that they can reduce their energy consumption, which would help them save on their hydro bills and all, and all of their energy bills and help the environment. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us Question. if the upcoming long-term energy plan might include more tools to allow more Ontarians to become more energy Thank better. you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the member that we can do a better job of informing Ontarians about the state of our electricity system. In fact, we heard this throughout the summer when we visited several ridings in the province to gather input from Ontarians on the long-term energy plan. The website offers a number of video shorts that explain electricity generation, distribution, transmission, and conservation. The site also includes an interactive electricity bill tutorial, infographics, 
and interactive exhibits about Ontarians' supply mix and smart grid innovations, encouraging a better understanding of the energy system and empowering consumers is a theme that will be reflected in a long-term energy plan. Mr. Speaker, there are videos on that site that are very, very simple and explain how the system operates and it explains to individuals how they can benefit from it, including how they can lower their Thank you. Rates. Thank you. Question the member from Leeds Grenville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, the Premier's words of support for local food ring hollow when I see how you let the Municipal very Property hollow. Assessment Corporation treat Ontario's local food producers. People like Nigel Smith in my riding, who makes fantastic cheese at Bush Garden Farmstead Cheese in Rio Lakes Township. MPAC is turning this amazing artisan cheesemaker's experience sour. One of the first visitors to Nigel's farm wasn't a customer, it was the MPAC taxman who slapped him with an industrial classification. Industrial is the opposite of what happens here, yet this ridiculous decision cost Nigel an additional $1,200 on his property tax bill. Minister, will you have a conversation with MPAC and explain to them the difference between artisanal and industrial? Here, here. Here. Minister of uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the question. I really do. And uh, we are looking at uh, at MPAC now. We are having a review. Parliamentary assistant to the Minister of, Ministry of Finance is doing an outstanding job alongside the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing on ensuring that we have a competitive environment. We want to make certain that our companies succeed, and especially our entrepreneurs who are the creator of many jobs. So I welcome the. Uh, the question: We will endeavour to review exactly what is being is what is occurring over there, and as I said, a review is certainly underway around MPAC all around the province. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mr. you. Supplementary. Thank you very much. Back to the minister. You know, minister, if Rather you want local can. food, you can't send the tax men in to hassle them. Nigel Smith spent three and a half years cutting through your red tape to make world-class cheese, and MPAC jeopardizes operation with just one, one uh, visit on the, to the farm. On the first I'm day. also going to tell you about Terry and Dave McGurn from Edgewood Farms, who for the first time in 12 years kept their pancake house closed. Oh. They gave it up because MPAC demanded that they pay a commercial assessment for a six-week yeah. yeah. operation. Yeah. Shutting them down wasn't enough, Speaker. MPAC then came and hassled them, essentially interrogated oh, Terry about displaying maple syrup, owning a cash register, or even part of a pancake griddle. It was absolutely disgusting. How many more businesses, farm businesses, Question. will MPAC shut down before you and the Premier do their job? So, Mr. Speaker, um, a report has just come out today reaffirming how Ontario is much more competitive than most jurisdictions in the OECD and in North America around its tax regime. And, that we're, and Mr. Speaker, we took initiatives to introduce uh, the HST to enable those companies to be even be more competitive, which the opposition uh, opposed, Mr. Speaker. And more importantly, the member is asking a question about finding ways to make taxes more affordable for businesses and entrepreneurs. He should stand up and support supporting Small Business Act, Mr. Speaker. That is what we're doing to exempt these very companies from paying those taxes, and they're holding it up. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll endeavour to look at what you propose or what's happening. I would be happy to do that. More importantly, I wish you would stand up for those small businesses by supporting them with this act, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, the people of Thunder Bay are telling this government that a biomass peaking plant won't cut it when it comes to meeting the uh, dem demands for energy for the future mining projects in the Northwest. The Premier told NOMA, the Northern Ontario Municipal Association, that she hears their concerns, but the Minister of Energy stood in this legislature yesterday and said he prefers to take advice from government bureaucrats in Toronto. So just who is calling the shots when it comes to making decisions about power for Northwestern Ontario Speaker. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I would suggest the people of, North Bay, of uh, Thunder Bay are calling the shots on this particular issue. We've had extensive consultations with them, with the task force that was set up in the committee. The chair of the task force uh, has indicated uh, that uh, he's pleased that we're uh, converting 
uh, the Thunder Bay station uh, to uh, biomass. Good news. He did raise some questions about the supply of the material. We discussed alternatives, how that could be addressed. Uh, and uh, that issue will be addressed, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Thunder Bay will have the energy it needs when they need it, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the whole Northwest, uh, it, under, the, uh, under the plan that the OPA has rolled out, Mr. Speaker, will have over $2.5 billion of invested wow. in transmission generation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's a great plan. A lot of research went into it. Tremendous consultation yes, with uh, the Aboriginal communities and the people in the area. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why she's hammering this. Obviously, it's for political reasons. There is no issue of reliability, Mr. Speaker, for the electricity and thunder. Thank you. Supplementary. Here yesterday, the Minister of Energy waved off legitimate concerns raised by the Common Voice Northwest Energy Task Force by saying, and I quote, they will not have to worry about their energy generation. Thunder Bay has heard that line from Liberals before, Speaker, after two previous power plant cancellations that cost the public $20 million. Speaker, you'll forgive Northerners if they don't take this government at its word. When will the minister take the advice of Northwesterners on electricity for a change? Thank you, Minister Energy. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party has no evidence for what she is saying. What about Kottawati? Mr. Speaker, the evidence is that Thunder Bay will have a reliable system of electricity, reliable generation, Mr. Speaker. The Atacocan plant, the Thunder Bay plant Good will stuff. be more than enough to meet the needs of Thunder Bay. And I would like the leader of the third party to come with some evidence of her stand Does and her position. Any? She has no technical evidence. She has no, no experienced evidence in any way, shape, or form. It's all anecdotal, Mr. Rainforest. Speaker. The system in Thunder Bay is reliable. They'll have electricity when they need it, and they'll have much more transmission than they have now in the very near future, Mr. Exactly. Mr. Speaker. So, your question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Aboriginal youth are Canada's fastest growing demographic and also the fastest growing potential workforce. Almost half of Aboriginal peoples, First Nation, Inuit and Métis in Canada are less than 24 years old. We know there exists a gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, both in terms of educational outcomes and income. Mr. Speaker, we also know that the success of Aboriginal people in Ontario is essential to the success of all Ontarians. We also know that in Ontario, we're working together to build a successful, vital province where everyone has the opportunity to connect, contribute, and achieve their goals. Only in this way can Ontario be the fair and just society it aspires to be. Mr. Speaker, can the minister inform the House what Ontario is doing to narrow this gap? Thank you. Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, on November 18th, I represented Ontario at the Aboriginal Affairs Working Group in Winnipeg. As a recent national chair of the Aboriginal Affairs Working Group for the past number of years, our government has supported the continued call for a First Minister's meeting on Aboriginal education with Aboriginal leaders. We've been urging the federal government to work with us and the Aboriginal leadership to close the gap on these issues. It is really important, I can't stress that enough, for the federal government and all of the provincial and territorial Aboriginal organization leaders to be at the same table to find the solutions to these important issues. At the working group, the provincial territorial ministers and the national Aboriginal organizational leaders discussed a range of opportunities to reduce barriers to education and increase opportunities. And I also work Answer. with my colleagues in recommending that the federal, the federal minister have more dialogue with his provincial counterparts on these issues. We look forward to working with the federal government on these you issues. We need the federal government. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's good to know that Ontario is showing leadership in the effort to advance these important issues. Mr. Speaker, I understand that another priority is of the working group is to end violence against Aboriginal women and girls. About 15 per cent of Aboriginal women in Canada who had a, have ha, who had a spouse or common-law partner in the last five years reported being a victim of spousal violence, more than twice the proportional among non-Aboriginal women. Missing and murdered Aboriginal women represent about 10 per cent of the homicides in Canada, despite the fact that Aboriginal women make up only 3 per cent of the total female population. Mr. Speaker, I know earlier this year Premier Wynne joined her provincial counterparts at the Council of the Federation in supporting the call of the national Aboriginal leadership on the federal government 
for an inquiry into missing and murdered Aboriginal women. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the Minister update this House on how the Aboriginal Affairs Working Group is addressing this issue? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again, this issue of missing and, uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal women is huge across the country. And again, at the Winnipeg uh, Conference, and I was there last year and I was there just recently, and all of the provincial ministers and all of the nas national Aboriginal leadership the team called on the federal government to launch an inquiry into missing and Aboriginal women. And the federal government has not taken up that challenge, has not taken up that, that initiative. We continue to press the federal government. The national Aboriginal leadership continues to press the federal government. The national Aboriginal women's leadership groups continue to press for this call. But so far, we haven't even had a nibble on this issue. Last year when I was in Winnipeg, the federal government didn't attend. This year, the Answer. federal government attended for a part of the morning to discuss this issue and then uh, went off to other duties. This is an important issue. Thank we you. need the federal government at the table. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Minister, two days ago, in response to our leader's question about the Niagara South Hospital Project, you suggested I ask you a question about a hospital bill in my riding. Here it is. Firstly, Minister, thank you for the offer. <laughs> After 10 years, the Markdale community no doubt appreciates your offer to answer our long-standing question about the construction date for the new hospital. Secondly, I kindly remind you that your government did challenge Markdale to raise $12 million for the new facility, Done. which they did. Done. And then you provided $4 million in planning funding to erect a, and erected a sign on the site Thank advising you. a new hospital is forthcoming. So, Minister, please tell us. What is the intended construction date for the new Markdale Hospital? I tell you, this is really getting exciting here because the party that was opposed to building new hospitals, the party that voted against building new hospitals, has now decided that building new hospitals should in fact be a priority. They have seen the light and it is it's a very happy day, I have to say, for the patients of Ontario. The member, the member opposite knows that uh, we are in very active conversations uh, with Grey Bruce Health Services. That I've had a meeting personally in my own office with uh, leadership from that organization. Speaker, uh, we acknowledge that uh, that the people of Markdale actually need uh, um, uh, enhanced health care. Speaker, and we are working hard to make that become a reality. And it's wonderful to have the support Answer. of the party opposite. Wow. Speaker, again to the minister. Well, ministers, thank you so much. But you know what? Conversations don't provide health care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With all due respect, minister, you encourage me to ask you about the Markdale Hospital project. If you're not prepared to talk about the new Markdale Hospital, then you need to tell the hospital staff, the patients, the donors, and the volunteers what they should do at the sign that you erected on their site in celebration of the new build announcement over 10 years ago. Minister. You need to assure the people of Markdale and the Niagara region as well that you won't compromise their health care and that finding money for their hospital projects is just as important as finding money to cancel gas plants. Yep. Minister, will you do the honourable thing, restore faith in elected officials by honouring the commitment made by your Liberal government here, here. to the people of Markdale and build the Markdale here, here, here. Stop the clock, please. You see it, please? You see it? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, I think that the member opposite should talk to some of his colleagues who have been blessed with new hospitals in their ridings, who will know that it does. There is a process, Speaker. Uh, I'm sure the member from Simcoe North could talk about Waypoint. The member from Barrie could talk about the Royal Victoria. The member from Cambridge could talk about Cambridge Hospital. The member from Burlington, even though she voted against it, Speaker, we're going ahead with the Joe Grant uh, Memorial Hospital expansion. The member from Halton could talk to you about the Milton District. The member from Leeds Gairdville could talk about Brockville Mental Health. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London would be more than happy to talk about St. Thomas Elgin. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke could, would happily talk about the dialysis at Renfrew Victoria Hospital. The member from 
uh, from Wellington Hall in the Hills. I know, would be more than happy to talk about Groves Memorial Community Hospital. We have an aggressive and proven history of building the hospital infrastructure our patients need, and I'm delighted to have the support now. Thank you. Change of heart of the Conservative Party. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Recently, I received a letter from the uh, regional government. They will be asking this government to improve rail services to Kitchener-Waterloo again. In 2011, with much fanfare, this government announced the GO train with service was coming to Kitchener-Waterloo. Constituents in my riding were promised rail service to Toronto that works for them. They were told that service would start with four trips in the morning, four trips in the afternoon. Eventually, two-way all-day service would connect Kitchener-Waterloo to, to Toronto. Yet people are only getting half of what they were promised, at two and two-way all-day service won't happen for at least another 15 years. Speaker, my constituents need transportation options that allow them to get to work. When will this government follow through on its promises and provide the rail service that the region needs? Well, Speaker, I can tell you that the member from Kitchener Centre has been a passionate and strong advocate of enhanced uh, transit uh, uh, from Kitchener to Toronto, Speaker, and uh, he's done an excellent job. As, as the member uh, from Kitchener Centre has said, you know, we've done so well. People want more of the, what we're doing, and Speaker, I can tell you that we will continue to improve transit in this province. You know, we are committed to getting people out of cars and onto public transit. Since 2003, we've invested more than $16.1 billion in public transit, and that's more than 7.7 .7 to go transit, Speaker. Our commitment is very clear. We're committed to public transit, and we will continue to make sure that we get as many people out of Answer. and into public transit as possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Constituents and businesses in my riding are looking for more than empty words. Rather than wait for this government to live up to its promises, tech companies are taking matters into their own hands. Google, BlackBerry, OpenText, all of these companies have been forced to provide shuttle services to their employees in the region. At a recent City Age conference, leaders of the 800 tech companies that employ 30,000 people in Kitchener-Waterloo repeatedly stressed the importance of rail service to the region. When will this government include the rest of the province in its transit plans? Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, I think we have found common ground because our commitment is exactly to public transit that the member opposite is asking for. We know it's important, and we know that the Waterloo region is one of the largest and fastest-growing urban regions in Ontario. Speaker, that's why we've committed up to $300 million to support rapid transit in Waterloo region, and that this project will connect the cities of Kitchener, Waterloo and Cambridge while linking up with the Grow Go Transit Services. And Speaker, more good news, the federal government has joined the province. It, it has committed up to $265 million. This is the single largest transit infrastructure investment in the region's history. Wow. Speaker, in total, we've committed uh, more than $400 million to public transit to Waterloo Region since 2003. This is great news, and we're moving forward together. Yeah. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Leeds Granville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by. I'm, I'm waiting for quiet. With answer to given by the Minister of Finance uh, concerning MAC, uh, MPAC and uh, regulations against uh, local food production, this matter will be debated Tuesday, 6 p.m. The member from uh, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs on a point of order. Uh, speaker, I would like to introduce Adela Wan, Wan, who is a policy advisor over at the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs. She's here. But here's why she's in the legislature today. Because when the United Way did its fundraising campaign at the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, she bid about $100 to come and visit question period and then have lunch with the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. So welcome. The member from Bremenley, Gordon Malton, on a point of order. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I ask all the members in the House today to join me in welcoming a good friend of mine. I call him brother, uh, though he's a little bit older than me, uh, Mr. Harpajan Singh Tello. The, uh, member from Durham on a point of order. Nice uh, teacher, Nancy Derrick Ney, uh, who is the grade five teacher at Charles Bowman School, or Char Charles Bowman School in Bowmanville. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. The Minister of uh, Citizenship Thank you, and Mr. Immigration. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Rosemary Sadler, president and author, and she is the president of the uh, Black History Society of Ontario. Welcome. The member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I take the liberty of introducing Ajax Councillor Joanne Dives, who is in the audience on the far side this morning, with a number of other residents who are working to protect our Ajax waterfront and improve the water quality Thank and livability in that area. Thank you very much. Again, uh, maybe it's my, my problem, but uh, I remind members that we've set aside time for doing introductions, and it's very difficult to try to uh, allow for this to happen if we're not going to stay with the procedures. So I remind you, please, if you know they're coming and they're not here, introduce them during that time period, and it'll still show up on the record, and it shows that you cared about their visit. So I appreciate your cooperation on that issue. There are no deferred votes. This House will stand recess this afternoon until 1 p.m.